Well, good morning, church. I'm excited uh, about this series, and I hope that uh, you will be too. Uh, I want to talk to you over the course of about the next five or six weeks about disciple making. We'll talk about what is it. We'll talk about what does it mean for us, and I hope it'll be something that blesses you. Often when I speak to you, I have a hope that by the time the message is over, you'll be inspired or convicted or something like that. Today, I want to ask if I can educate you a little bit. And I want to ask at the end of the message today, if you will, like the Bereans, take it home and ask yourself, do I agree with that message? And if I do, what implication does it have in my life? And so that's the goal for today, for you to think deeply with me, for you to take the message home and contemplate if it's true, what does it mean for the way that I should live? And so let's begin with a word of prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we want to say thank you. Thank you for giving us another day on this earth. We want to say thank you for just a beautiful season. We're thankful that you are a creator and sustainer, the giver of life. We're thankful for your Holy Spirit, the presence of God that helped create the world and now resides within all of us who are believers in Jesus. Lord, we pray that you might pour your love into our heart, remind us of who we are. We pray that you might gift us to make a difference in the world. We pray that you might forgive us when we fail you. We pray that we might be people who have received mercy and who show mercy. And Lord, more than anything else, we pray that in our lives, Jesus Christ might be lifted up. For we believe that if we lift up Jesus Christ, we will draw all people to you. And that in so doing, they might discover the joy that we have living the life of a disciple. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus, our ever-living Savior, teacher, Lord, and friend. Amen. Look at this quote. It comes from C.S. Lewis, and it says, The church exists for nothing else but to draw men, and he means mankind, into Christ, to make them little Christ. If they are not doing that, all the cathedrals, the clergy, the missions, the sermons, even the Bible itself. It's all simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose. And so we ask ourselves this morning, do we believe this? That the purpose of everything is to draw people to Christ and to help them become little Christ. You see, that, the argument today, is the core mission of the church is to help people become little Christ. To look like Christ, to act like Christ, to think like Christ, to speak like Christ, to serve like Christ. Everything that happens should happen with the idea that we want people to be formed more completely into the image of Jesus to be fully devoted God followers. And so we ask ourselves this morning, how do we do that? And of course, that leads us to the Great Commission. And this morning we ask the question, should the final command of Jesus, the final words of Jesus, should that final command be of first importance? Is it often true for you that the last thing you say before you leave is the most important thing you want to leave behind? And so we ask ourselves this morning about that related to the Great Commission. Would you mind reading it with me? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the ends of the age. Now, when I say Great Commission, what's the first thing that comes into your mind? Great Commission. Is that what you think? It's what I think. 
Every time I've heard Matthew 28, I've thought evangelism. That's what that is about, right? But what if we followed the text? Doesn't it say, go and what? Make disciples. How do you make disciples? And how do you make disciples of all nations? By baptizing them and by teaching them and by teaching them to do everything that I've commanded you. And I'll be with you while you do it. You see, one of the other things that I'm noticing about the youngest generation today is that instead of hearing evangelism, which was the word I heard, they're hearing social justice and mercy as the word. Go, therefore, and serve the poor, feed the homeless, visit the prisons, change the world, clean up the environment. Was that Jesus' great commission? And so this morning, I want us to understand that disciple-making is what the Great Commission is all about. Go and make disciples. And so here's a definition of disciple-making for you. Disciple-making is entering into relationships to intentionally help people follow Jesus, be changed by Jesus, and join in the mission of Jesus. You see... If the Great Commission is for each of us, what God is calling us to is to help other people follow Jesus, be changed by Jesus, and join in the mission of Jesus. Disciple-making. Go and make disciples. And so this morning, I want us to understand that disciple-making does involve going. It does involve mission. It does involve evangelism. It does involve baptism. It does involve teaching people to obey everything that I've commanded you. But the key thing to understand is that's how you go about making disciples. But what Jesus commanded us to do was to make disciples. All of these other things happen when we as disciples are living out Jesus in the world. But our goal has to be making disciples. And we've got to be intentional about that. C.S. Lewis says he doesn't think the world was created for any other reason than for people to become little Christs. And so I want to back all the way up for just a minute, and I want to ask, what does it look like? What does disciple-making look like, even in the Old Testament? Because sometimes we think disciple-making began with Jesus. It was a revolutionary, brand-new thing that he came up with all on his own. But let's go all the way back. And we've read these texts. But notice in Genesis chapter 1, God's creating everything. And so what we know is that on the first three days... He created uh, these great spheres. And then on days four, five, and six, he placed things into them. And on the sixth day, as God is placing things upon the earth, he stops to do something unique, something different from everything else, and that is to create us. Look how he says it. Let us create mankind in our image, in our likeness. God said, I'm going to do something different here. I'm going to create humankind in my image. So that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and the livestock and the wild animals and all the creatures that move along the ground. And then it says, so God created us in his image. You are the imago Dei, the image of God. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. We were created differently. We are unique from every other part of the creation. We are created in the image of God. And if I had time, we could even look at the fact that we really perverted that image, right? Sin perverted the image of God in each of us. And so what did Jesus do? God said to Jesus, let us create God in man's image. 
so that we can redeem them all. And so Jesus becomes the God-man who will be the subject of discipleship. But here we discover that there's something unique about us. Okay? Now, think with me. How did God want Adam and Eve to live in the garden? Why did he place them there? Oh, we say, well, he placed them there to tend the garden. And that's certainly true. And to work, that's certainly true. But if we look at the text, God is not a surprise visitor in the garden. Adam and Eve heard the sound and they knew exactly who it was. This was not God's first visit to Adam and to Eve. What we begin to understand is that God was regularly visiting them. He was showing them how to live into the God life by spending time with them, by helping them to understand this world in which they lived. And so what we need to understand is at the very beginning, God was the first disciple maker. He was the one that was showing Adam and Eve how to live as God followers in the world. And of course, instead of listening to God, they began to listen to others. And things became corrupted. And so what we discover is that God is the first disciple maker spending intentional, relational, transformational time with Adam and with Eve. Now the reason that I say this is because also notice that we might get a glimpse into what God's original plan was for us. Enoch walked with God. He knew God. They were like this. He was a fully devoted God follower. And the text says one day, God said, come on with me. You're done here. And Enoch was not because God took him. And so we begin to think about disciple making in the Old Testament. And it leads us to this passage that I don't want us to miss. Because before, excuse me, before there was a great commission in the New Testament, there was a great commission in the Old Testament. It was the way that Israel was to make disciples and to teach the next generation. And notice that it too is intentional, it is relational, and it's transformational. It begins with these words, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. It was a way of standing up and looking at each other. They would recite this in synagogue every time they went into the synagogue. If you've ever been to a Jewish home, there is something on the outside of the door that they will touch on their way in. It's got Deuteronomy 6 in it. It's a way of saying, this is our passage. Love God with every fiber of your being is what God says, what Moses tells us. But then notice, they are to pass on this faith to the next generation. Look what it says in verse 6. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts and then impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk, walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frame of your house and on your gates. Your pursuit of God is what you are now to pass on to the next generation. Parents must have a relentless and transformative pursuit of God. They've got to want God with every fiber of their being. And then they are to impress to take the life that they're living and impress it upon their children. How? By making God the topic of conversation around the house as you sit, as you lie down, as you get up, 
as you walk together. You see, what God tells us is that that which is in, inputted into the hard drive at night becomes transformative. That which is spoken of early in the morning becomes transformative. It's the first thing you hear in the morning is about God. And the last thing you hear before you go to bed is about God. Whenever you walk into the house, it's about God. When you see the decor, it's about God. When they begin to talk as they walk along the road, it's about God. It's because parents are intentional and courageous and conspicuous about their pursuit of God. And so we begin to see that this is the great commission of the Old Testament. Love God with every fiber of your being and then impress your life upon the next generation that will come after you. So three things I want you to notice today. This is intentional. It doesn't happen by accident. It's a purpose. It's goal oriented. We are to impress the God life that we have upon the next generation. What does it look like in God's eyes to be an impressive parent? Is it to raise kids that go to Harvard and then MIT and Wharton School of Business? Impressive parents in God's eyes are those who pass their faith on to the next generation. That's what it looks like to be an impressive parent. They think about how do I pass this faith on from the time they get up in the morning until the time they lay down at night. And quite frankly, it is the top priority of their life is to pass their faith on to their children and to their grandchildren. It's relational. It happens in the normal stuff of life. What I love about this vision of disciple making is that for those of you who, are, who live full lives, this is not one more thing that you do. It's what you do while you're doing everything you've already been doing. It's a new intentionality. It's making relationships matter. It's investing in the people around you during the normal stuff of life. It's the natural conversations that ha happen. It's the walks. It's the talks. It's the time that you spend over a coffee cup. It's relational and it involves talking about Jesus in the midst of our life. And last, it's transformational. It's the idea that we have a goal in mind and that is for people to become more like Christ. To look more like Christ. And so we're constantly asking ourselves... How do we do this in such a way as that people become more like Christ? You know, that's one of the great gifts that each of us has is the opportunity to help other people look more like Jesus. You know, I took Ralston to lunch, our, our college minister on, uh, was that Friday? I think it was Friday, right? It's been a crazy week. It's final exams week at Lipscomb. And so everything's just running together for me. But we went to lunch and we were thinking about this program that we did on Wednesday nights this year. And in the fall, we looked at the Lord's Prayer. And in the spring, we looked at the Psalms. And what I noticed about the time that we spent with about 35 college students every Wednesday night is that it really was transformational. It was intentional. We knew exactly what we wanted to impart. It was relational. It was based upon spending time together. But looking back, it was also transformational. People walked in praying about like this, and they walked out praying about like this. They walked in feeling about this way about the Psalms, and they walked out feeling this way about the Psalms. And what happened is over time, intentionally, relationally, transformationally, they began, they began to take on a greater depth of prayer. And this is what we want to be thinking about as we're thinking about what we do with our life. Well, if you ever wondered how things moved from Deuteronomy 6 to John the Baptist, things began to shift again when Samuel came on the scene. And you might remember that there were people who uh, were pouring their life into Samuel, Hannah, and the family. 
But then they sent him to go and to be at the temple, at the tabernacle. And he learned new lessons there. And what we discover is that Samuel then developed a school of prophets where people could go to be discipled. Isaiah had a school of prophets where people could go to be discipled. John the Baptist walked in those same steps and developed a school of prophets where people could go to learn more about how to be a God follower. And so what I want us to see is what Jesus is teaching in the Great Commission is what God has been showing us since the garden. Is that disciple making is deciding to be intentional, relational, and transformational about the time we spend with other people. It begins with us having a deep and relentless pursuit of God. That we want to love God with every fiber of our being, our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength. And then we want to pass on what God has given to us, to others, in a very intentional way. Disciple making. Is it the core mission of the church? The man who founded the Navigators said these words, Hudson Taylor, the Great Commission is not an option to be considered. It is a command to be obeyed. Well, here's what one person thought the Great Commission looks like today. So guys, if you feel comfy telling someone about me during the regular course of your life, that would be nice. If your denomination does baptisms and if the Trinitarian nature of God fits with your worldview, then great. Include those aspects in your effort. But be careful not to suggest that they follow my commandments too closely. That would just be weird. And you don't want to be weird. The great opinion? No. The great suggestion? No. The Great Commission. What does it mean for you and for me to take Jesus' final words as those that have first importance in our life? Disciple making is entering into relationships to help people follow Jesus, be changed by Jesus, and then to join in the mission of Jesus. Jesus is the hero. He's the hero of my story. He's the hero of your story. And every person that you meet, whether they realize it or not, Jesus is the hero of their story. Just waiting to be discovered. And disciples are those who are intentionally introducing Jesus to others. When we follow the Great Commission, we also do have great compassion. These things do happen. I'm not saying they're not important. I am saying that when you make them the focus of a church, disciple making doesn't happen. And so you've got to decide what comes first and then what is a result of that. Disciple making was Jesus' strategy to reach the world, transform the world, and he did it by investing in a few over a season of time. And so this morning we hear these words, go and make disciples. It does involve being baptized. If you've never been baptized and you think you can be a disciple, you're trying to do it without the forgiveness of God, the power of God, and the spirit of God. We've got to do what Jesus commands us to do the way that he commands us to do it. And after that, we've got to be people that are intentional about teaching people everything that Jesus has commanded, believing that the power of God is in that. Disciple making, the core mission of the church. Do you buy it? If you do, how is it going to reprogram the way that you think, the way that you live, the way that you parent, the way that you grandparent? That's what I want us to be thinking about this week. And we'll move more deeply into Jesus as the great disciple maker next week. But let me pray for us as we begin to ponder what does it look like to make disciple making 
the first of importance. Heavenly Father, we pause to think and to think deeply. What did you mean when you said these words? Lord, we pray that you'll not let us leave this message here, but you'll force it into our thinking this week. What would it look like to be intentional, relational, and transformational in the way that we live, the way that we introduce people to Jesus and show them how to follow Jesus and welcome them into the mission of Jesus? Lord, we pray that you'll help us and that your Holy Spirit will guide us as we strive to lift up Jesus in all that we do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you read all of Matthew 28, what you'll notice is right before Jesus gives the Great Commission, what has happened is that Jesus has risen from the dead. And the power of God is on display. And the Roman soldiers have run to the high priest to tell them that Jesus has risen from the dead and the high priest have shelled out money to the guards to tell an alternative story. Jesus didn't rise. The disciples came at night and stole the body. We live in a world today where people are trying to tell an alternative story about Jesus. They're trying to give the world a story about Jesus that isn't true. And what Jesus says is while they're over there telling what isn't true, that lacks power, that won't transform, I'm counting on you to go into the world and to tell the truth and to make disciples who will make disciples so that every generation, every nation, every tribe will know the truth that the power of God is on display in Jesus Christ and is available to you through him. If you need that message today and we can bless you in some way, come to the front. If not, let's decide. God has given us a task to do and we need to figure out what that looks like for us. How can we minister to you? Come to the front as we stand and sing together.